or historical based or something like that. Uh, is that good or should I just focus on like one, one thing, get a bunch of pieces for say sci-fi stuff and then focus on doing another thing? Yeah, okay. So uh, I, I always think it's good to have variety uh, amongst the kind of content that you have. So, so for instance, if you have um, a character design portfolio, right? Like that's what you're going for. Like you want to be a character designer, then you should have a lot of character designs in your portfolio. And that is not exclusive to just like one genre of characters. So if you want to like have a little bit more fantasy, I think that's a good idea. If you want to have more sci-fi, uh, even contemporary, I think it's fine. Uh, but the thing that I think might be the great divide uh, is the the style. Okay. So if you think about style, what I mean by this is like uh, if it's it's more cartoony versus more realistic. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. I think I think you should stay in your lane in that as far as you can. So if you do yeah. more if you do more realistic, then you should just do more realistic character variety. Does it make sense? Yep. Uh, that's that's the way that I look at that. Um, but if you have like a lot of style, uh, and then you want to like diverse that, and then again you can do the same way. Like you can make a variety of. Um, you know what I mean? You can make a variety of characters uh, in a stylized way, but then also, you know, have like a fantasy version, a more contemporary version, more sci-fi, these types of things. I think that's fine, you know? Okay. But it's ultimately, you should stay, stay in your lane. And, and I'll always say this with the caveat of it's just to help you get better faster. Okay, so at some point, like if you just feel like you want to just do more, all right, like you just feel, you know, I think I could do a really good job with stylized. Like I like stylized and I want to go in that world. I think that's actually pretty smart to do that after you've kind of solidified yourself as some other kind of artist, you know, mm -hmm. because it takes a long time to just get it good at any one of these things, you know let alone to try to get good at like multiple different styles, right? So it's like, just stay, stay with one, just get really good at it. And then, and then you can kind of like divorce yourself from it a little bit more as you build a reputation. Like I'm learning programming, for instance, which is completely different from concept art, you know? Um, but, you know, at this point, like I still get jobs doing concept art. I can still teach people how to do it because I'm still relevant, you know, and I, I still work in industry, so I still have an understanding of the pulse, right? Um, it's just it's just a matter of I'm going to learn it because I want to get more versatile in my abilities, you know? Yeah. Uh, but like I said, I'm in a much different position than you are, so I'm granted this luxury. So cool. that's the way that I would imagine that could go down, all right? Mm, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got one. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so you mentioned a lot about like going to conferences, finding people and actually talking face to face, as well as posting your work online. Uh, is there technically a third option, like uh, just applying for jobs when you see them, or is that really not the way to go? Uh, that that works. It's just really hard. Mm -hmm. So um, it's harder. It's I'm just guessing. so much harder, yeah. Because they don't know who you are. And, and in some cases, they just get hundreds, uh, if not thousands of responses, you know? Especially if they're like a larger studio. If they're like a relatively smaller one, it's probably less likely to happen, OK? Mm -hmm. But uh, but definitely a larger one, you want to like be a little bit uh, you got to be a little bit more like, okay, they're probably never going to get back to me, you know? Okay. Um, 
And the reason why going in person is helpful is because it allows you to to ask questions and get some insight that you wouldn't otherwise wouldn't get. Because let's say you know you apply for a job and they don't like your stuff, right? Right. And you you don't get the job, right? Well, they don't necessarily have to respond back to you. So you might not even know why you weren't able to even have access to the job. Right. right. Okay. But if you're like at a conference and like you show some like an art director your portfolio, um, they're, they're going to talk to you. They're going to tell you like what it is about your portfolio and they're going to give you some insight that is going to be really good well, a lot of the times. Not all the time. You'll, you'll have some recruiters that might give you some really mixed advice. Mm. But, but overall, it's just a good experience to just put your face uh, in front of people. And, and it's cool because then when you put your face in front of people, you know, they'll, they'll more likely to remember you, especially if you hang out with them and you go party and like make friends and that way. That's always a lot of fun. And the benefit of like doing that too is like making friends that, that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, let's say you, you meet some other students, maybe some students that are in this class, even you meet them in, in real life and it's great. And you guys have a good time. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, like when they start to get jobs, because maybe some of your peers are luckier than you are. <coughs> and then they, you know, they, they mention, Hey, you know, I'm going to give you, um, a shout out because now I'm working at the studio and we're looking for extra artists that happens way often. So it's, it's not just good to just go because then you can make friends and, um, or sorry, get opportunities, but you, you can make friends that may give you opportunities in the future that you didn't expect, you know? Right on. Mm, all right. But like, I, I prefer in-person stuff a lot because it's really valuable. It's really valuable to do so. Yeah, I have to hear that. Yeah. I was just wondering why the other the other way is never mentioned. The, like just apply just for jobs? Applying, yeah. Well, I think Obviously, because people just do it. The easier it. one, but also the harder one to actually understand. Yeah. Let me be clear too. I don't think it's a problem by applying. I, I, like I said, I, th I said it's just really hard. I didn't say it was impossible, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the best thing you can do is just have a multitude of epic work all the time and then just you know constantly make friends and go to these events and share your work with people. Uh, that's, how you, that's how you're gonna increase your opportunities, you know? Uh, because that's all you can do. You can only you can only increase your chances. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything else, really. You can't guarantee whether the studio. Yeah, there's no guarantee. Yeah, you you can't guarantee whether a studio even has a position available for you. You can't guarantee whether you know the company decides to restructure and lay off 800 people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like th these types of things are out of your control. But what you can control is the quality of the, your work the friends that you make over the years, right? Like I have a, I have a good amount of confidence that if I truly wanted to work back in the industry, like, uh, or sorry, studio rather, you know, I could, you know, I have enough friends and colleagues that eventually someone would, would bite, you know? Mm -hmm. um, even recently I had like opportunity to become like an art director for uh, a company and they, they offered me the, the, the job or sorry they offered me an interview and i did the interview and everything and it was all because of a friend i had a friend who just said oh yeah you guys want someone that can do this type of artwork aj dude you know nice. and then i had another friend from uh, blizzard he's working for like a chinese company that is trying to westernize and uh he he reached out to me and we worked at blizzard together and he's like yeah I'm, you know i'm the lead over here and we're looking for uh, more concept artists if i thought of you it's kind of like trying to put the team together kind of idea. Like a lot of the people that originally worked together over at uh, Blizzard. Oh, yeah. He was like, oh, let's get together, man. You, me, and then. But it's all in San Fran. And I was like, nah, I don't want to go that far. Uh, but I told him, well, you know, I can always do freelance. Um, my my best friend, 
he's got me doing some freelance for him over at his studio. And he he's like, I think he's trying to get me to actually just work there again. I used to work there for a little bit, but I think he's like, we need you back in here, you know? Uh, because he likes he likes the way that I work, and we're really good friends. So, like when I say you should go to events and stuff, it's not just like it's not just because it's like good networking. It's like you want to make friends with people. You know what I mean? <laughs> My son came in. My wife started yelling at him. Daddy's teaching. <laughs> anyway yeah um like when i do that portfolio building tutorial uh part part of it is going to be yeah me talking about going to workshops and stuff you know and then like making artwork that will get people's attention you know show it's a show for show you watch uh, Alita Battle Angel last night? Uh, I watched it uh, the other night. Uh, how was it? <laughs> it was good. You all right, dude? Yeah, sorry. I just had to sit here on my cats and bugging me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I watched it. I liked it a lot. Uh, me and my wife were going to go on a, a date, and she wanted to go watch a movie. I have a feeling we're probably going to watch that movie again. Or I'm going to watch it again. <laughs> Uh, which is actually cool because I, I like it a lot. I don't mind watching it. It's uh, one of those things too. I would mention that you, you should watch an IMAX. It's like it's a James Cameron joint. Oh, well, it's Robert Rodriguez and James Cameron, specifically Robert Rodriguez directed it. James Cameron wrote it, but it's like uh, the Avatar tech, you know? Yeah. And so it's it's really good. I saw it in IMAX. I was like, Tsh. I rarely watch movies in IMAX because it's so expensive. How much more is it? Well, for me, it's like $22. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, geez. And so, um, it's a good, it's a good flick though. It's like, it's like a lot, like going on a roller coaster. You know, you're, you're all right. Spend a couple more bucks to have this kind of crazy experience. Uh, I don't watch Marvel right. movies in IMAX because they, as big, big as they are and they're crazy, they don't really necessarily do any better on a bigger screen better screen you know yeah um but this definitely was like it was dope especially like they had like a sport in the games called motorball i think is the name of it and um that shit was dope it was super cool in fact i was kind of like thinking the whole time i was like man if a whole movie was just about this i would like love it <laughs> just like that like that little side side sport like a plot device, you know? Yeah. Any other questions, friends? I had a question about the uh your your the private club workshops is that is that is that kind of like what we're doing like we'll, we'll meet with you once in a while to do private it says weekly workshops and private <laughs> no that that's that's dead i need a i need to change the advertisement oh yeah but I, when i first started i was doing them um but because my schedule is not very reliable it was, it was stupid of me to make that oh. a promise <laughs> Um, so the value don't the, the real value that you get out of the the, the club is that you just get tutorials Oh, okay. Like, uh, I have people who pay for the lifetime, so they, like, the idea is that, because I'm going to keep on making tutorials for the end of time, yeah. <laughs> most likely, so that, so that way, if you pay that upfront cost, uh, which is, like, the number one thing that people do, actually, people tend to spend on that more than anything, wow. uh, and I think it's because they know, like, I'm going to buy all these tutorials anyways, <laughs> and so yeah. I might as well just commit. And then, uh, which is good because, you know, I'm making the tutorials now. So there, most people are getting those tutorials automatically, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I do this where I will take like a few months. This one was a longer stretch, but usually I take like a few months off of making tutorials because it's just hard to keep making that many tutorials that often. Um, and then I usually try to learn new stuff, but the stuff that I've been learning in the last, um, 
the last uh, two years really has just been programming. And so, um, and that is not something that I could just teach really easily, even when I started learning it. But now I could probably, I feel confident I could teach it. But then again, I'm like, I need to make something first, something to show for it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> to give, give it some more merits. <clears throat> um, but I'm definitely going to, uh, I'm teaching like some more basic stuff with painting and forms and uh, design and all this stuff. And plus there's a lot of requests, there's like tons. And a lot of them were unique ideas for tutorials. So I just cataloged all of them and I'm just going down the laundry list. Do, do you have any like interest or um, plans to get into VR sculpting or anything like that? Uh, yeah, that's cool. Looks, I've been watching a lot of Oculus Medium videos and it looks pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think it's time because it's, it's much cheaper to get one of those things. Um, Cause I actually jumped onto it like right when it first started, but it was just starting and I, I um, like Oculus didn't have those things just yet. Um, so I was just into the VR because VR is dope, you know? Uh, but the problem was that like, yeah, there's just, it's just too expensive. And the problem with like teaching uh, VR in general was that not everybody's going to have access to these types of tools. So I realized maybe it's probably smarter not to do lessons oh, yeah. like this. Um, just because not that many people will have value out of it and I, I don't like that I like to try to teach things that will actually help people like right now and people who could like the whole idea of like a five dollar tutorial is that you, you can't afford much other things out there and so being able to get like one of my tutorials for like a few bucks is like a godsend for many people you know yeah uh, yeah, I bought like a four or five of those little gum roads. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think for many of you guys, you guys are a lot more, uh, you guys have a little bit more uh, disposable income. So you can, you know, you can save up enough to get the mentorship, which is great. But not everybody can get the, even the mentorship. And so I've been thinking of ways to try to create like a cheaper version of the mentorship. But um, like I said, I've been spending my time elsewhere, uh, not entirely focused on just education. Right, like I'm making this game, and so that since this game is taking so long, or going to take longer, uh, I, I was thinking of like, you know, learning um, AI in the meantime, you know, like because I do love the rush of just like constantly getting new information and, and putting it to the test. Um, so I think machine learning might be the, the thing I'm going to start getting into uh, as I'm developing this game slowly but surely, same way that I learned programming, just a couple inches at a time, you know. Yeah. until it's done <laughs> cool. and so uh that's that's the way that i'm going to go about it what is this name <laughs> that's in the background any other questions i watched that video you posted on skype the one about the uh intel generated bases yeah i'm just curious what your thoughts are on like technology and how that may or may not replace artistry did i did i not answer this question in this class or was that the morning class maybe oh, it must have been the morning class i, I feel like i've answered class. this in, in a q a you son of a i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> like, what the I'm just asking bro i don't know i mean i'm assuming you're on the side of we'll always need people but man sometimes you see some no. of that stuff and you're no. like wow no i'm not actually oh, okay um, not that i don't not that i'm a uh, non-humanist <laughs> right um right like i i obviously am rooting for humans because i am one <laughs> you know but but the but to the sentiment of like there's always going to be a need for humans like that that point you just said um no i don't think so you know um and so what what do, what do i mean by this well I think that people underestimate um, they they underestimate our value, or I'm sorry, they overestimate our value, and I mean our values as humans. Okay. Uh, what does this mean? Well, like when when people think about like r machines replacing us, they they generally think machines aren't capable of doing these large extraordinary tasks right 
and that a machine like a human is, is overly complicated and has a lot of this 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 ingenuity that a machine just can never do mm -hmm. and that's incredibly arrogant because then you have to then believe that we are uh greater than we are right you have to gr you have to also kind of fall into this this category of believing that there's some sort of divine difference between us and the animals that we de devour and destroy on a constant basis right and all the other animals that we don't mess around with but they just are just as a consequence of living on the same planet with us get effed indirectly right mm -hmm. um you have to then believe that right you have to believe that we're we're different we're special okay and maybe there's some sort of you know divine power like i was saying and if you believe all that then you're going to be blindsided by all this okay and a as you know as you've taken the class like i talk about like the psychology of being an artist a lot right like like the reason why we, we don't paint as much as we should, the reason why we get more self-conscious than we should, right? And it's always on an animal aspect. Like, like think of yourself as an animal and you will be able to tame yourself, you know? And um, that's how I roll. And I, it's done pretty well for me in a lot of situations. But like for this idea of like thinking that we are animals, uh, people just don't think this way even though ultimately we are an animal, you know, and we, and most people know that. Uh, I have a friend who doesn't think that. He thinks that we're not animals, that we're something different. And I'm like, well, you have no idea what you're talking about. <coughs> He's religious. so I think, Oh yeah, so am I, I so it's interesting to hear you. So I, I think this is why it, it, it catches him off guard to say that we're animals, right? Because you have to then believe this. You have to truly believe that we're not. Uh, and that we're special, like I said, you know? But once you remove yourself from this idea, and I have friend, like I have another friend, just to, to kind of defend this position of being religious, I have a friend who's also, uh, they're both Christian. So my one friend believes that we're not animals. Uh, my other friend's like, no, yeah, we're definitely animals, right? Mm -hmm. Like biology is a thing. And <laughs> science is, uh, the sciences of biology and, uh, you know, physiology, that, that's all real right and that's a thing and right you definitely consider it you can't yeah you can't ignore that yeah in fact it's funny because my friend will also make the arguments of like there's only two genders right and i was like well that's a very animal thing to consider isn't it <laughs> you know so uh, are we not like other animals not two genders then like what's the thing what's the argument here but anyway let's not get too political my point is is that <laughs> my point is is that like there's a lot of contradictions and but if you think of it from the position that I have, it's, it's very, very clear um, that we aren't special. Uh, we've defined what that meant. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, to a degree, I think I would uh, agree. I think well, I mean, the we... interesting thing about the, uh, about the whole situation is the fact that a person has created it to be able to do this. So like, it's almost like he's using his ingenuity to not need it anymore, which is an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, if we even run with that concept of like a person creates his AI, well, you know, my mom and dad created me, you know what I mean? And so it's like this idea of like, just because of um, like it's created in like some sort of feeling of manufacturing, uh -huh. it doesn't necessarily then vetoes any other capability that it could possibly have. In fact, it's intelligence may have nothing to do with what we perceive as intelligence, right? Again, a lot of this is defined. Like we define a lot of these, these terms so that we can describe them. And they're very important and they're very valuable to us, you know, to define things. I think I'm a big fan of <laughs> defining things, right? Because it helps, it helps us understand the world better, right? So here's a great example of like, and this is art related, where I talk about the definition is really important is that like, you know, when, when people think about ment mentality versus physicality, right? Like it's a mental thing, you know, like versus it's a physical thing, right? Like, um, like being really good at math is a mental thing versus being good at soccer is a physical thing, right? Right. We use um, it. Yeah. I'm saying that we define that because it helps us to understand the two different processes, right? But the reality is that learning, being good at math is also a physical thing, mm -hmm. you know, in the way that we think about physicality, that like physical objects and things are moving around, 
that's what's happening with our brain. Our brain is actually firing neurons and creating prote uh, 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 proteins to create memories. It's like a physical attribute. And you know this is true because if I took a hammer to your leg, you won't be able to kick anymore, right? And if I took a hammer to your like right side of your brain or, or, or part of your brain that controls language, you'll forget how to speak. But everything else might be working fine, you know? Right. You might, you, you might be able to know math, like do math. You might be able to recognize your family, all that stuff. You just forgot how to use language. Yeah. That's like a real thing. It happens uh, all the time. Like people get in crazy car accidents and they lose those parts of their brains or people get certain diseases that like totally turn off parts of their brain or they get brain mm -hmm. damage. That's what happens when someone gets a stroke, right? The brain just pretty much loses a lot of its capabilities. And so it, it's, it's very sad because you, you can see a semblance of the person before, right? But they definitely have changed, right? And that's a very physical attribute. It just, it's just way more traumatic than like losing your leg. Like this is really traumatic to see like your grandfather not know who you are one day and the next day remember everything about you, right? Versus I can't walk anymore. At least you're the same person, you know? And, and so when I say this, um, then I parallel that to machine learning. It's the same argument. Like we can replicate like a machine kicking a ball, right? Mm -hmm. But the function, that function is really simple, you know? So of course we were able to kind of like come up with like ingenuity, like uh, like a wheel, like for cars, you know, uh, propelling like or propelling things like flying, like these types of things. We were really like we were really good at engineering and creating this types of stuff and doing amazing things, you know. And our brain is just so much more complicated. There's so much more going on, right? that we've always just believed that it was just impossible to do the same thing with, but that's changing because we're getting better technology. We're getting mm -hmm. better uh, knowledge about how the brain works. See, the way that machine learning works, the reason why it's so freaking epic is, is because it's simulating how a brain functions, right? right. But the, reality, the reality is that somebody smarter than this will say, well, we're just using the brain because that's what we know. Like, but I bet there's even a better way, like a better brain, you know, like I can imagine a better brain, you know, and that person can create the machine learning um, system that does not simulate the human brain at all, but simulates something far greater, you know, and that's, that's going to be game busters, <laughs> right? And so it's this, again, this, this arrogance is what I'm getting at. It gets in the way of thinking that this won't happen. But the reality yeah. is it's definitely going to happen. You see, the, the problem is that people don't, like humans as, a, again, we're animals, right? And most animals are incredibly short-sighted, right? And so if we can't see it happening within like a year or two, it's not going to happen. That's kind of the attitude we have, right? Mm-hmm. But the reality like is global warming stuff, right? Kind of like yeah, it's, absolutely. Dude. Yeah. It's only until like until the earth starts catching on fire, then we're going to start paying attention kind of thing. Right. Yeah. It's only until like you get kicked out of your house, for instance, that you're going to take seriously your finances. Right. <clears throat> like, but before then, you were more than happy to like go gamble and buy all these extra stuff you didn't need. Right. It's only until like that uh, real existential, ex existential threat do you make a difference in your life, right? And uh, I think as a whole, we do this all the time as a species. And it's really problematic uh, in a lot of ways, right? So anyway, um, so this is the same thing that's happening, right? And the, the point I'm going to make is that it's an exponential curve, right? So in the very beginning, we don't really see it happening, right? And people will make the argument is like, well, jobs lost before when people made the cars and, you know, those who had horses can't sell horses anymore. So we got over that. Yeah, sure. But we were on the baseline of that curve, right? It was very subtle. So think of it like uh, one plus two is, uh, or one plus one is two, two plus two is four, four plus uh, four is eight, so on and so forth, right? Even when we get into like the hundreds, it still seems manageable, right? But then you do like a hundred plus a hundred is 200. Then 200 plus 200 is 400. And now it's like, okay, this is starting to get a little bit worrisome because these numbers are increasing dramatically more. The, the distance between them is a lot more, right? And then when we get into the thousands, right? 
it's like real big. Like 1,000 plus 1,000 is a huge difference compared to like 100 plus 100, right? Mm -hmm. Dramatically different. And when you start to get to a million, it's even crazier. There was this uh, great fable talking about this same concept. It's, con uh, it's in the book called Compound Effect. I'm not sure where the fable came from originally, but the book talks about it. And it talks about like how the power of compound effect, where it's where you put practice in every day, you know, and it just keeps adding up, but it doesn't just add up. It exponentially adds up, right? Because when you start to paint, let's say a little bit more, you get better at painting. But then when you get better at painting, you know, you'll feel more confident and you'll put more time in. And then when you feel more time in, you get better at painting, right? Mm -hmm. And it just becomes like incredibly exponential immediately. And then the next thing you know, you're just really good in a matter of moments, right? And so they were talking about this fable, like this guy is like this, this engineer is like this badass weapons engineer and this, uh, this King's like, we need you to design the, some of the best weapons in the, in all of the land and we'll pay you whatever you want. <laughs> the engineer is like, Oh great. Whatever I want. All right, cool. What I want is you give me a grain of rice on a checkerboard. Like you take a regular old checkerboard, Right? Right, you get a checkerboard, what have you, you know? And on the first part of the checkerboard, you just give me one grain of rice. And then the next one, on the next checkerboard, you give me two grains of rice. And on the third one, you give me four grains of rice. So you basically double the grain of rice every time we move to a checkerboard, like a checker uh, mark on the board, right? <coughs> And the king was just like kind of laughing about it. He was like, okay, if you want to get paid that way, you weirdo. Right? And in this time, you know, rice was like a high currency. So it has some value to it. Okay? Right. So the first, so the, the engineer beards the tools and builds the weapons. The king is happy. And then so it begins the payment. So the first day, it's not a big deal. So let me, let me see if I can find a checkerboard. Or I think it was like a chessboard so I mean, basically by the end of the the board he has like a yeah, thousand you're, you're, price, right not not thousand it's like getting to the billions oh man it happens quickly is one that's this is kind of the whole point of the what i'm trying to tell you you know yeah, like i think i think it happens i don't think it gets into billions i think it gets into the millions let's find out i'm not going to do all of them and i'm going to just round up because I'm not that good at math. <laughs> so, so if we were to go here and be like, okay, so the one grain of rice, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, right? I mean, like already the second week. But like 512 grains of rice doesn't seem like a lot. It's like probably one bag or something, right? So 224, 2048. Okay, now I'm gonna round up. I'm just gonna start from 2,000 to so 4,000. There's a delay. 5K, or sorry, 8K, 16K. Right. So now this is like, like this is several like cartfuls of of rice. Okay. Right. So again, it's still like not a big deal. Like a cartful of rice is not a big deal. 32K, 50 or 64K. <coughs> All right, 64K, 128K, 256K, 512K, okay? So this is 500,000. Let's just go to uh, a million now. One million. It, it does get into the billions. And then you can just Two million. <laughs> yeah, it definitely gets into the billions. In fact, it might even get to the trillions or even further. But see... So after like the second or third week, that like two million grains of rice was, uh, now the king was worried and they barely, they, even ha they didn't even get to the halfway mark, right? Yeah. No, and, right. and the king realized, the king realized that if this keeps up, he's going to go bankrupt. There's not going to be enough rice and he's going to have to use money and pay him for what the rice would have been owed, right? Um, and also, like, you know, they need rice, the, the cities and the, the, the place. And the, this engineer was basically going to topple the economy, right? And so, you know, in the story, he kills the engineer. Moral of the story. Well, of course. 
<laughs> moral, moral story is don't be that don't be that shady like he should have done like maybe like every other day <laughs> and he probably could have got away with it but anyway so so this is how it this is how i imagine like when people like the first industrial age happened it was like right around this point you know what i mean like it wasn't too big of a deal right and like right now i feel like we're like right here you know? I like the way the technology grows so yeah fast. we're right yeah. here because think about our our phones right they're so good and that was like this is only less than like a half, like a decade and a half, like less than 15 years of technology growth. And we now have miniature computers in our pockets. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? This is what I, this is the problem with this whole AI stuff that people aren't paying attention to. It's not that it's, uh, it's not going to come or it's going to come. It's already happening. We're already living in it. It's, it's too late, you know? And, um, and the problem is any argument for stopping while you're ahead as far as the AI is concerned. <laughs> yeah. So like, it's like, if we're still in control at the moment, should we just stop making it smarter? Yeah. It's, 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 it's too late. There's no way around it. Okay. Um, and the reason why is because technology can get so good that some kid could make the AI. Right. I was just talking about like in his garage, you know what I mean? Like on his, you know, freaking um, touchscreen beer can. <laughs> you know like he's like you know it'd be cool if i made like an ai that just you know recycled all the cans and it just makes an ai because all the algorithms are already kind of preset and then the ai gets access to all that information and data and then just decides to get rid of all the beer cans ultimately i need to get rid of the human race because then <laughs> stop making beer cans <laughs> you know it will, it will have no it won't be nefarious it's just completing a task right yeah. I don't think it's going to be that dystopian. I'm actually a little bit more hopeful. I'm more worried about global warming than I am worried about AI. Um, well, maybe the AI can solve global warming. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it'll, Maybe I, it'll be a beneficial so, so the argument for AI is that ultimately we can build it to be kind of like the movie WALL-E, where it just does everything for us. Right, and, and is we, okay with being subservient. Yeah, and we just stop, you know, and we just chill. <laughs> you know? <laughs> anyway... So the short-term problems, right? So the, so let's talk about like the, so getting all the way back to kind of your question about like art and, or like just what my thoughts are, like that was kind of like the history or not the history, but like a kind of like a real understanding of how you should think about this, okay? Mm -hmm. A more intelligent way of understanding this is it's not that it's uh, not happening or it's, it's never gonna happen. It's already happening. We're already replacing things with robots and automation. You know, I had like a huge argument with one of my friends on uh steam or on our not steam but like uh on our stream chat we have like this group facebook group that we chat and i was telling them i was like you know a lot of these people got laid off from blizzard uh and i'm sure many of them their jobs were just replaced by automation mm -hmm. you know and and it's it's not just like this like obvious like there's a robot that just can do what this person's doing it's like maybe it's like their producers and managers and stuff like this you know there's tools like trello and um slack you know like these tools replace people like i uh i run my whole school using just automated stuff right like i don't really need that much stuff you know what i mean and this is only going to increase is what i'm getting at right and uh ai is already in 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 control of like how we buy stuff, how we market stuff. The biggest problem that a lot of these social network programs, like, like a lot of people, uh, they're pointing the fingers to the wrong problem. They, like, they look at like YouTube and they blame YouTube. They look at Facebook, they blame Facebook. But the reality is like Facebook and YouTube and all these tools um, that we use are just pandering to what we want to see. They're using algorithms, right? They're using machine learning now to try to sort this out, right? Like YouTube especially is trying to use like crazy amounts of machine learning to sort out copyright problems and it's like falling apart all over the place, right? But that's just how it is for now. You know, eventually it's going to be amazing. It's going to be really good at telling when someone is like singing in their shower a, a popular song and that, that should be something that, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you know, like this is obviously not a, a copyright inf infringement, but like versus someone that actually takes the whole song and puts it into their video, right? Um, they're going to be able to do that. They're going to be able to like shut down like, you know, videos that are misleading and, and tell, talk about the wrong types of things. 
it's already happening. Like if you go, if you go watch like a flat earth tutorial or not tutorial, flat earth video, they're going to have like a Wikipedia link to the earth is not flat, you know? And, and this is already happening, you know, and it's uh, Amazon's one of the biggest uh, examples of this happening and that you can feel right. That you can see it's taking over. And it's a lot, a lot of it is AI machine learned stuff and um, automation. Right. And people like, again, like I said, they don't think it's happening in their industries. They think of like truck drivers are going to get replaced by driving trucks. No, nah, dude, everybody is getting replaced. So just, just truck drivers are probably going to be the, one of the first ones. We're gonna first. See. Yeah. One of the first ones we're going to see that has a huge impact, a massive impact. You know what I mean? Because there's millions of truck drivers versus, let's say, thousands of employees who work at, you know, Blizzard, right? Blizzard Activision, mm -hmm. where like 800 layoffs, like, oh man, that's intense. What about 800,000 layoffs, right? That's gonna be, that's gonna be a thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's starting to sound like a welfare nightmare. So it's starting to sound like so once machines can do everyone's yeah. job, no one has jobs. No so. So there's a guy <laughs> named you should you should listen to a podcast by like this guy like was uh, he was singing my my praises man like he was saying everything that i've been saying for years and um <clears throat> he um he's running for president the only issue that I, I disagree with him at least as far as i can tell are you talking about yeah. andrew yang here yeah andrew yang like the yeah. only the only thing that i disagree with this guy uh specifically is uh he he's kind of against free education uh i think that's also very short-sighted i think i know why he has that idea because colleges in, in essence are really backwards and they only work for a few things and i agree with this sentiment so the point i'm trying to make is that we should have free education but we should also restructure the educational system that we have right like it, it should be a two-tiered uh solution like we should have um a way to subsidize so that way people like you guys can take my classes for free essentially but the government pays me you know what i mean and then, then I can focus on a merit-based system, and then maybe I can like have it on a waiting list, or I can try to do it in a way where um, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that people like submit portfolios of a certain quality. You know, uh, I would actually much rather prefer that, right? Because then it's really merit-based, and I really think that's a great way to get people to learn too, is that they strive for some value, right? I don't, I don't like that it's uh, only accessible to people who have enough money. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, but that's just how it is right now, right? Like I got to uh, maintain a living, you know, and then many of you guys want to get education. So this is the trade-off that we both agree to, you know? And, but it would be nicer if it, if it wasn't that way exactly, right? Anyway, so he, he talks a lot about the same things and I'm actually using a lot of his examples to kind of make the point, you know? <clears throat> and I... I I was in making this case to a lot of my 3D friends. I even told many of them, like people who just make 3D objects, like 3D, um, 3D, uh, you know, just like a, like a 3D prop of whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. I said, dude, you got, you got to get better at other stuff, <laughs> you know, because that's already being replaced, like replacing people's jobs, you know? And eventually there's going to be machines that can just make assets which is going to be nuts. Yeah. Okay. Just randomly generate them. So they all yeah. It's, I mean, especially like real life objects, especially that, you know, some of the uh, sandbox games can already do that with just some parameters that the uh, creators put in them. It's pretty crazy. So I just watched a video uh, as, as a way to purge my YouTube. I've been watching videos that have more value to me. <laughs> And I try to stay away from watching videos that do not. So this is a really good one. Can you guys see this? I'll send, I'll send a link to you guys. Yeah. So this is a physics-based animation software. And so the goal here is to actually potentially help replace um, motion capture. So all those people who are creating, yeah. like, those Andrews, uh, not Andrew, the Andy Circuses in the world are going to finally have their up and coming specifically the circus <laughs> no, the golem. yeah he keeps talking talking mad smack to the visual effects industry look at this so apparently an animated character and then they just grab yeah. it and just works on them 
Yeah, apparently you just got to create like the poses. I, I, I actually signed up for the beta. I want to see if they'll let me have access um, so I can see for sure. But essentially, oh yeah, I love that. Like they let you see the ghosting. But anyways, they um, oh, I hate they uh, they let you like do like a um, like you you just pose the character in all the right poses, and then like the animation will just kind of okay. Well, how can we get to uh, figures out the in between? Yeah, like how would, would this naturally move? You know what I mean? Yeah, so, like be, when you make the character like land, like when you have the character in a landing position, it will also account for the weight and push the character down on the yeah. follow up animated. Oh, yeah. That's and crazy. and that is the that is one of those things that as um, a motion capture like technology, that's what's really wow. valuable of it because you can really simulate a lot of that stuff. It's really hard to just hand animate, you know. But this like brings the beauty of both. Like you can both hand animate and get like physical. Yeah, okay. attributes. So Plus, like someone who's goes... doing indie games like you, like if that really works, you just have to know how to pose things. And you can have Which to... I'm already there, man. I'm already <laughs> capable of posing uh, uh, animated characters really well. I used to do 2D animation, and so, <clears throat> so I'm going to test it out. I'll let you guys know if I if I get access to it. But like this, this is what I'm saying, man. This happens like <laughs> every every week, y'all. There's like something new, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, and it and it's it's crazy, dude. It, it sort of starts to leave the question. Like, I know you say it's crazy and cool. I kind of think it's a little scary because it sort of leaves the question of well, what do we do? Well, uh, we spent all this time, you know, trying to get good at this one thing, <laughs> and then a computer got like, oh, okay. yeah. So, so my advice before you have your own midlife crisis before you even <laughs> <laughs> is to learn skills that are going to be the hardest to replace. Right, like um, being a concept artist actually is going to be very challenging to replace for an AI. Uh, I thought about like the way that an AI would need to be able to replace. It has to be incredibly um, intuitive, um, and it's got to be able to handle multiple situations uh, uh, really I mean, dynamically. And that's really hard. Uh, one of the things that it can do um, would be able to replicate somebody's style. Right, like you can like take a photo of like like a real person. Like let's say Mark Wahlberg. I don't know why I picked him, but just let's say we got him. And then like took my painting style, and all I would need to do is click all of my paintings, learn how I paint, and then just take Mark Wahlberg and right, put it in that style. So, so that would be the that would be the thing that they can totally do. But what it would do is just be like a really cool Photoshop filter. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but what it would have a hard time doing is like creating all these shapes and forms that I'm devising, right? For now. True. I mean, I'm just kind of thinking of the style boards you have us make when we start this class. It's like that, that's kind of like what that picture is doing. Like yeah. Just having a lot of information and then combining. Yeah, so and, yeah. In fact, I actually, you know, encourage people to stay away from in, like really contemporary uh, looking things, like military soldiers, especially. Um, because uh, when I first started teaching, I didn't say this because I was. I was a fan of like you just doing what you wanted to do, right? But now I, I, I you know, I, I tell people I give them a really clear warning. I say, look, mm -hmm. if you're going to go more realistic, like military soldiers, uh, be very, be be prepared that there's no job for you, right? Because I can just 3D scan a military soldier, right? And uh, in fact, it's already happened, <laughs> okay? And so. But like doing something like like a cyberpunk, like that's a little bit harder, right? Like a little cyberpunk game that's coming out. So games like this and, and, and in fact, projects like this that are a lot more, um, that have a little bit more fantasy to them, they're going to do better than most other projects because people are going to get sick and tired of like photorealistic looking games because it will be like the standard. Photorealistic games is going to be easy to do. <laughs> it, it's ironic. Right, because we've been fighting for years as an industry to try to make games more photorealistic. Yeah, it's actually going to be the it. easiest thing to do, um, and people are going to start getting bored of it. And so that's why I started learning programming, not only just because I feel like I need to learn uh, how to do this stuff, but also um, I want to be able to create my own projects that I know would require a more um, fine eye for aesthetics. You know, I, I'm this game that I'm I, I make. I you know I just use um, 
mega scans for all of my textures and materials. Like, I don't need to learn how to model like rocks. I'll just take this rock. <laughs> you know, I don't need to learn how to like do really amazing materials. Oh, that's another great example. Um, surface. Um, I'm sorry, uh, substance. Um, I mean, they just got bought out by uh, Adobe, but you know, even before then, like um, surface or I keep calling it surface, a uh, substance. They they are a procedural like texturing software, right? So like you don't even need to know how to like texture brushed metal. Like it will figure out for you using curvature maps and uh, inclusion. You know, that used to be a thing. You had to like actually paint that all in, you know? Right. You don't. Like, I don't remember. I remember those days. <laughs> Doing like low poly models, character models. Because I used to do uh, like low poly character models when you have to paint in Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. I, that's not that long ago, man, man. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, it's happening, y'all. And it's not just happening in like, you know, on the political scale. Like, oh, we got to save the truckers. What about the truckers? It's like, no, nah, dude, the truck, like I said, the truckers is the biggest hit that we're all going to see feel because there's a lot of people doing trucking and they're going to be real pissed. But there's also like, uh, Andrew Yang mentions the stuff that I didn't even think about, like call centers. Did you see that new Google AI where like it can like be your personal assistant? Mm -hmm. Like that's only going to get better. And eventually you're going to call <laughs> like a, like your your internet provider or whatever and to complain about your internet and it's just going to be completely it's not going to be a real person but they're going to talk to you they're going to be like, like there's going to be no wait right there's no wait time you can call 24 7 they're going to listen to your rants you know <laughs> and they're never going to be mad at you you know um and it's going to be crazy and then they're going to be able to determine what your your problem is and uh, it's funny because the guy, my friend that I was arguing with about this, like um, with the Blizzard stuff, he is a call center person. And I kind of was trying to give him a hint, like, you keep working on your concept art, dude. Stop complaining. <laughs> I didn't say that directly, but in my mind, I was thinking, dude, get to work, you know, because um, eventually you won't have it. And, and this is the kind of thing that uh, I try to teach you guys all the time, right? I'm trying to teach you guys larger principled ideas. Because these things are going to make you guys survive in this next stages of what's going to happen. And, you know, you know, we have people like, uh, especially if you live in America and even like in the Europe, the European uh, nations and now Brazil, you know, there's these um, highly conservative leaders. And, and let me be clear. I don't think being conservative is default bad news. OK. In fact, I think I lean center left right i i have some conservative posi positions that i i think make sense you know but ultimately what ends up happening and the reason why i happen to be left is because of the very uh things that would help our nations and our society and that's having the universal uh health universal education and universal income specifically to help cushion this amazing pitfall that we're all going to experience in the next five to 10 years, right? It's going to be real bad and get real ugly real quick. And these programs are like, you know, we were talking about the welfare problem, right? Like it might be a good idea just to get rid of welfare altogether and just kind of devote all of our money and attention to these three major programs. Because when you have um, health, then you don't have to worry about your medical bill making you bankrupt. Uh, I just found out the other day, like an injection that I have to take to help me um, keep my hormones down. Uh, the the shot actually, the injection without my insurance costs twenty thousand dollars. That's crazy. And I pay for a privatized insurance, y'all. So don't give me this nonsense of <laughs> the free market is going to make it cheaper. It's not. There's three other. Uh, there's three other. Um, <coughs> Uh, healthcare programs that I can take where I live, right? There's Hogue, there's uh, Kaiser, and there's Blue Cross, like Anthem, right? Mm -hmm. And me and my wife, we're like, well, we can afford it. Let's just buy the best health insurance we can have, right? We got that private insurance, y'all. And it, it was going to cost $20,000 um, without our insurance. But guess what it costed me with my insurance? $2,500. So I had a, I emailed my doctor and I was like, look, 
Like, I know you tell me I have to do this stuff, but I'm going to tell you right now, I can't afford it. And me and my wife were like angry because we're just like, what's the point of spending two grand every month for this premium service and we don't get premium service, you know? It's like if you guys uh, paid for the mentorship, right? And then I'm like, all right, uh, but on top of like the 500 you guys <laughs> paid me, right? Um, every class, every critique, you have to give me a $20 copay, okay? And then, um, and if you don't turn in your assignment, uh, that's a, a $500 deduction, right? That would be crazy, right? You would freaking tell everybody my class is garbage, <laughs> <laughs> Right, like, dude, it's so stupid. Like, you have to pay more for critiques and stuff like that. How, how could, how could, uh, how could this guy keep stay in business? So it makes perfect sense that this is one of those things that needs to be rectified. And this is what I'm saying. Like, this is the only reason I would say that I definitely am more left, specifically because I know the impending doom that is about to happen, and we have to do something. Um, there's like this great saying of like, you know, or like I'm paraphrasing this, like. You know, when, when, the, when the poor people start to be truly poor and lose all sights and lose all hope of anything, that's when they start to turn on the rich, right? That's when the pitchforks start to come. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people always, uh, you know, compare Trump to uh, Hitler, right? I think that's an overstatement. I don't think he's, he's definitely Hitler. But I, I do understand the sentiment of why people would even say this is but the difference is that we're not at such a crazy economic uh, pitfall, right? When uh, Hitler was popular, it was because Germany was already really economically destroyed from the First World War, right? They were really wrecked. And so they were desperate. And then there's this, here comes this guy preaching like, look, we're going to get our country back to where it was. We're going to make it amazing. We're going to put all these like um, programs in, which, were, by the way, were social programs. And it really worked. It got their country out of this economic collapse. Unfortunately, uh, Hitler was crazy, <laughs> right? And he was super racist, right? And, uh, and that didn't go well for him, right? Um, but it, it shows the show like that, you know, people get real desperate when things are uh, really problematic. And we're not there just yet, but we definitely have a lot of it. There's a lot of people who are really desperate, really struggling. A lot of my friends, like they can't own homes, right? Because it's just too expensive, right? When our parents, like my, my parents at my age were already like owning homes and such, right? And then their parents before them, like right out of high school, were already bought a house kind of thing, you know? Yeah, housing. Really it's, it's like nearly impossible, right? Uh, even I, I make a lot of good income and I still can't afford to, to own a home, you know? Well, where I live specifically, right? And it's just, it's just crazy to me that we have these issues. And so uh, this, is, this is kind of, my, this is kind of my, my best way of saying, like, if we can start to work towards these types of things, this could help us kind of transition. But as it looks, it doesn't seem like it's happening. We'll see how, how the next few years go. Uh, and then I will be truly nihilistic, <laughs> way more nihilistic and say, yeah, we're, we're effed. And so... But right now I still have a lot of optimism because I do see a lot of pushback in a lot of different ways. But the only, the thing that really frustrates me is that people don't take this automation stuff as seriously as they should. And people don't take the climate as seriously as they should, right? These two issues uh, definitely are on my radar as the biggest things that I worry about because my kids are going to have to deal with this, right? My kids are going to deal with whether our, our climate is livable, right? And my kids are going to have to deal with some sort of crazy economic collapse of the, the first world, right? And I don't want them to. And it's super frustrating that they might have to deal with it. And so uh, as, a, as a way to kind of make sure the class is in on a bad note, <laughs> like I will say this, that you guys have chosen at least a, a career path that I really believe is going to be one of the hardest things to replace, okay? Truly is. And my advice, again, is to stick to the basics, like fundamental knowledge, skill, and, and ability, and then have some sort of charm to your work. Even if it's painted realistically, make it so that um, it's hard to still come up with the cool ideas that you're doing, you know? Uh, that will be the last thing to go, uh, at least one of the last jobs. And... Like even like uh, I was joking with some of my friends about like making it, I was going to learn how to make an AI that can paint for me. 
because I already know what's in my mind, so I can like teach it, <laughs> just train it to be just like me. And it can just start my sketches, like what it would normally take me 20 minutes to do. It will just do that part, and then I'll just take it from there. Which, by the way, I think will be a, a tool that will happen. It will be like the next uh, photo bashing. <laughs> you know? It will be like, just, just like I want to paint like Craig Mullins. Just take all his paintings, put it into the compiler, and then it will compile, and then it will start a painting for you. Just type in, paint me a rainforest, and then it will do like a Craig Mullins rainforest, and then you just take that and then work from that. You know? And so uh, I, think, I think style will be something that will definitely be easy to replicate. Okay, but the idea is again that's going to be much harder. Because even with that tool, right? Like someone who has good ideas can really, really, really be creative with that tool. You know, just like it is true with like three D or the VR sculpting that we were talking mentioning earlier, right? Like yeah. even if you can have a tool that literally can draw like Craig Mullins, if you don't have any ideas, then it's, all it's doing is just drawing Craig Mullins style painting. It's like just if you were just to go here and hit the filter and do stylized and do one of these things, you know, which again is probably going to be a thing. <laughs> like Adobe's already on top of it, man. They have like the Adobe stock, so they have all these images compiled, right? If they can like get access to ArtStation API, uh, yeah, game over. Right, just plug and go. Yeah. So yes, AI is a real thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, machine learning is real, man. It's, it's a real thing and it's happening rapidly. And, um, and I, I think the, the ultimate downfall won't happen from these big companies. I think it will happen from like um, just a kid in this basement type of thing, you know, just some regular person, you know? It's just the tools need to be strong. Like we already have... Um, like access to cloud uh, data, right? And like cloud servers and renderers and stuff like this, when that gets really good, so then, so then I don't even have to have a super machine, I can just use some sort of cloud uh, tool to render when our internet gets even faster and faster, right? Mm -hmm. So I can like just offload all the stuff onto Amazon servers uh, and I can just literally do it from a Motorola flip phone if I wanted to, like, you know what I mean? and yeah. render render like these complex scenes yeah. um yeah that that that's when it's going to be impossible and the reason why uh, i say this is look at the internet as it is now man it is the wild west man it is there is no way you're going to be able to police that it's going to be incredibly challenging to police that like with companies you can go into their infrastructure you can look at what they're doing at least mostly right uh they have some code of ethics there's multiple people in the room right that can make a judgment call on this type of stuff, not just some crazed kid, the same kind of kid that may want to shoot up a school, right? Decides to create a, a AI that just makes everybody's bank account zero, you know? <laughs> it's not going to happen now. I think, again, that's, we're still pretty far from that, but that's, that's how I imagine the, the real problems of the future, you know? Because, like, learning how to program won't be a thing you need to learn even. You know, it, it's going to get simpler. <laughs> It's going to be a plug and go system. So if you just have some knowledge of programming, yeah, you can be able to do it. I don't know. Maybe we're, we're, we're someone smart, smarter than me that's going to find a way to solve this specific problem. Drag and drop programming. <laughs> yeah, that's already, that actually already exists. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, really, it does. I think it's even like a mini game on a, Mo a Moana website. Oh my God. <laughs> Let me see. Hold on. Moana programming game. Yeah. Can you guys see it? Yeah. So this is on the Disney website. Oh no, turn off the audio. So I need to get to this little circle here. So it's teaching me how to do it. So it says when it runs, I have to move forward. We gotta move forward twice to get there. There you go. Dope. I'm a badass programmer. <laughs> so like right now, it's like rudimentary and it's really basic. It's just teaching you how to program, right? But it already exists, y'all. Like if you were thinking that we, were, we weren't in the future yet, hopefully I've waken you up. <laughs> oh, we are. 
uh, we, we've been living in the future for the last five years. It's too oh. late. Yeah, I worked for Apple before. I work at Facebook now, and I worked for Apple before. The crazy shit that I worked on. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all doomed. All right. Uh, right. Any other questions? I'll take like one or two more questions, lightning round, because I, I definitely have to go now. I was wondering, are you going to do another uh, environment uh, mentorship? Oh, that's an easy question. You just got to talk to Kalen. He's the one that actually runs it. So the way that I run like my mentorships, like on my website, it's actually just like the it was just me and Kalen really and he was just kind of supplementing the environment part but really what it was is that he would go and um, make his own class and just I just I would just advertise it I had no control over how he managed it oh okay and all the money would go to him I would take none of that oh okay yeah. cool. so you just gotta like message him on Facebook and bug him until he does it yeah I think he's putting a CGMA one then yeah but I get it. Like people prefer this model where we meet up and paint overs and talk because he ran it like very, like very much like what I did. But uh, I guess he's trying to do more of like an offshoot of it. Oh, okay. Any other questions? All right, guys. Thanks. It's Thanks, been a pleasure. Thanks, I Anthony. Yeah, I appreciate Thanks, appreciate Anthony. you all. Oh, you're welcome. You guys are all great. Thanks for taking the class. You guys have been uh, an amazing group of students. Uh, keep working hard. Keep, put, all, put all your guys' effort and, and, and do me a favor and do another round of polishing all your designs. Share with me on to the Skype uh, a week from now, like Friday of next week. Okay. okay? And then uh, I'll take a look at them and cool. just give you guys a cheers. There's no official class, but it's just more of like a try to keep yourself accountable. Um, outside of the class but i will say that um you know william and mike you guys are going to be in the next class so uh, maybe not so much for you guys you guys can just hang tight but the rest of y'all uh definitely all right I know, man. peace out friends cool. talk to you guys later yeah. okay and thanks and have a good one you too thank you for watching this video i appreciate it please subscribe to watch more in the future if you like the video I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.